The Knights of Ishgard had mobilized in full force. Link channels were abuzz with chatter, commanding officers demanding information, soldiers filling the streets, not knowing exactly what they were looking for. Members of the highborn families were politely asked to stay out of the way, whilst those in the broom were pushed over and viciously questioned. However, one person admitted to seeing something that matched the description of what they were after. Finally, after the knights approached the described location, they could hear someone, a man, who sounded like they were sobbing. They eventually found the back alley where the noise was coming from, and then they saw him. The priest that had been snatched and dragged out of the temple of Halone by a black figure. The priest was on his knees, his neck in the grip of a dark gauntlet. He was staring up at the one holding him down, crying and confessing to all manner of sins. Some of the knights couldn't believe what they were hearing. If true, the priest was confessing to no small amount of heresy, if not outright treason to the Holy See of Ishgard. Eventually, a captain of the guard stepped forward, ordering the one holding the priest down to release him and submit to the will of Halone. The blackened knight who hadn't stopped looking into the priest's bloodshot eyes finally began to turn their head. As soon as they met the gaze of the knight captain, the freezing air of Ishgard felt like a new ice age, as the nerves of all the knights present were shook. The blackened knight never let go of the priest's neck, dragging the man to his feet as he gasped for air. The lone knight drew a greatsword from his back with a single arm, pointing it at the Ishgardian soldiers. You should have brought more men. They declared in a tone bereft of hesitation. As the knights readied themselves, the alley began to darken as the shadows around them began to grow and devour the light. The glowing eyes of the lone knight were painfully visible, and soon, it wouldn't only be the priest begging for mercy. Good day to you. I'm glad you could join me as I pull out a story that even the Holy See of Ishgard wished to expunge from history. Unfortunately, this is a story that isn't easily forgotten, as it speaks to something deep within our hearts and souls. That nagging sensation one feels when they observe something objectively cruel and wrong, unable to find a way to excuse it. Most people are able to restrain this feeling. They understand that any immediate action taken will indeed come with immediate consequence. But there are those in this world who cannot look away. They cannot forget, and they never forgive. Today, my friends, we will discuss a group of pariahs that have chosen to walk an ultimately lonely road. Yet these people feel that it's still a road that someone must walk if no one else will. Today, we will allow ourselves to be satisfied in mind, body, and spirit, knowing that justice has been done. Today, we will discuss what it means to be a Dark Knight. The history of the Dark Knight is one born in blood, so let us turn our gaze back about 600 years ago to the 960s of the Sixth Astral Era, within the holy city of Ishgard. Our story begins with an Elzen commoner named Trefaniel the Unshod. Born a peasant boy, Trefaniel had little to no chance at becoming much of anything in a city-state that placed such a high merit in one's pedigree. However, this young man was born with an unshakable determination and fearless conviction. Even as a common soldier, he showed more promise and willpower than many highborn knights. His fierce sense of justice did not go unnoticed. Through many acts of valor on the battlefield, this commoner impressed the right people and was knighted, becoming Sir Trefaniel. This was considered a prestigious honor, especially since he wasn't connected to any of the four noble houses in any way. Sir Trefaniel was proud, of course, but he swore to himself he would never forget his lowborn roots and would always champion the less privileged before the nobility. It was this desire to always help the meek of Ishgard that caused the hairs on the back of his neck to stand on end when he saw a clergyman drag a squirming child from the broom. He followed them, 
as a twisting sensation in his heart refused to let him ignore what he saw. He approached the closed doors of the clergyman's domicile, and what he heard behind those doors spurred him to action. He entered without warning, catching the clergyman off guard. What Sir Trefaniel bore witness to made his eyes widen and his heart grow colder than Helone's spear. The clergyman was taken aback, clearly not expecting a visitor, much less a knight of the church. The man tried to quickly explain his detestable acts as a sort of exorcism for the child. But what Trefaniel saw was no exorcism or holy boon. What stood before him was evil, and it was within his power to end it. Without a single word, he drew his sword and approached the clergyman. The man shouted at him, ordering Trefaniel to step away. But there was no warmth or understanding in this knight's eyes. The clergyman began to panic and beg, making up every excuse under the sun. Trefaniel finally answered the criminal's babbling as he lifted his sword and brought it down, ending the man's life with one single strike. Later on, Trefaniel was made to answer for his crimes against the Church of the Holy See. A knight attacking a man of the cloth, regardless of the motives, was nothing short of high treason in the eyes of Ishgard. He eventually was made to defend his honor in trial by combat. But as you know, Trefaniel was a war hero, and with that same unwavering resolve, he defeated his opponent with ease. Even though he won his trial, not the judge or jury were willing to let this man stay in Ishgard. He was accused of heresy, and that his very soul had fallen to darkness. As such, they decided that he would be stripped of his knighthood and exiled from Ishgard. Trefaniel roared in response, declaring that he would happily sacrifice any title that required him to turn a blind eye to a child's suffering. With that, he marched alone through the streets toward the Ark of the Worthy. There was no praise for the punishment of sin, no cheers for the glory of justice. Only silence as he tossed aside the shield that bore the crest of his station. What was once a symbol of pride and honor was now a cold and heartless reminder. He left Ishgard with a newfound resolve. He saw with his own eyes that the evils of our world could take any shape or form. He was seen as nothing more than a monster, so he would become just that, a monster that hunted and preyed on monsters. Despite the church's attempts to smother this history, his deeds echoed throughout not only Ishgard, but the entirety of Curthus. His tale awoke something vengeful in the hearts of those who heard it. These people, together with Trefaniel, were prepared to commit all forms of sacrilege in the name of upholding justice. No castles, armies, or titles would free a sinner from their punishment. And with that, the legacy of the Dark Knight had officially begun. While often called the Dark Knight Order, they rarely gather together and only travel in small groups if at all. However, all true Dark Knights are expected to follow their code of ethics, which essentially boils down to protecting the weak and striking down evil, no matter what form it takes. Those who fail to, or stray too far from the path, will be hunted down by others of the Order. While considered champions behind closed doors, a Dark Knight's existence is often a lonely one, since death often follows in their wake. The Dark Knights are as feared as they are respected, and it's all because they're unafraid to bring justice and punishment to those that deserve it, whether they be rich, poor, man, or monster. But their crass disregard for law, etiquette, and due process often paints them as villains to some cultures. Now that you know the history and origins of the Dark Knight, let us go over the powers and abilities that have caused even raging monstrosities to cower in fear. 
When people think of Dark Knights, they often imagine a sword-wielding fighter that's able to manipulate the powers of darkness itself. While not entirely wrong, let me explain the how and why. Originally, Trefaniel and his first generation of Dark Knights were just that, knights that committed dark deeds. They were individuals with superior swordsmanship that specialized in combat against overwhelming odds. Since a Dark Knight was almost always fighting alone, they needed to be stronger and more skilled than an entire unit of soldiers just to survive. It apparently wasn't until the most recent generations of Dark Knights that the conversion of Aether into spells became commonplace. I have no record stating who began this arcane practice or when, but what we do know is the result. This darkness aspected magic school would eventually become commonly used by Dark Knights and was given the name Dark Arts. Like Red Mages and Thaumaturgy, this magic school focuses on making the most out of one's personal pool of Aether. This method of magic casting is formed by stimulating and agitating one's personal Aether with their emotions. Things like fear, wrath, and hatred cause the user's Aether to ignite into a dark flame. This shadowy fire is the source of a Dark Knight's greatest strength and is sometimes called the Abyss. This power fuels the spells and darkness-based abilities of a Dark Knight. Its power is so ravenous, it can even take the Aether and Vitality of others, empowering the Dark Knight instead. Since the things people see as our worst emotions are the spark for their power, a Dark Knight's magic is often seen as unsettling, and creates a feeling of dread in those around them. If igniting one's Aether sounds dangerous, that's because it is. Since this power is stimulated by your raw emotions, it's paramount for a Dark Knight to be in complete control of themselves and said emotions at all times. For example, if someone who is easily upset or overly emotional tried to use this power and failed to control it, the arcane and entropic feedback could kill them. It's a fine line they walk, between controlling their emotions or being controlled by them. This is why many Dark Knights are seen as cold, heartless, and distant. This is by the nature of their training, as they attempt to keep themselves in a state of complete emotional control. Yet, some Dark Knights are rather friendly and even jovial, which begs the question, why? This brings us to the greatest secret of a Dark Knight's power. While it's true that negative emotions like rage serve to ignite the Abyssal Flame, what is the fuel? The greatest Dark Knights come to this realization that the truest source of their power is not anger or hatred, but the emotion that created them, love. As corny as it sounds, Love is the true source of this power, and allow me to explain why. The strongest Dark Knights possess a profound love for something. Think back to the story of Trefaniel. He loved Ishgard, and he loved the lowborn people that he came from. That love demanded that he follow the clergyman, and to see someone defile that love sent him into a cold rage. It's often said that the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. And this could not be more true for a Dark Knight. All of that spiteful darkness that threatens to devour everything around it was created by the blinding light of love. This is why the strongest Dark Knights are often the hardest to spot at a glance. Their strength comes from a place of calm acceptance. They fundamentally understand themselves their emotions, and their desires down to the subconscious level, meaning that they're not just able to control their arcane powers, but they can also put the entirety of their being behind their strikes and spells, allowing a flood of darkness and magic to devour and negate attacks, as well as overwhelm their opponents. Now that we understand the source of their dark powers, let us move on to their choice of weapons and attire. 
Two-handed greatswords have a long history, dating back to before the Third Astral Era. A greatsword's reach allows the wielder to fight at a distance, providing tactical advantages. Its weight, combined with the kinetic force of the swing, is difficult to block, causing weak shields to break on impact. However, the reason they're not commonly used is because of how unwieldy they can be. If the blade was too long, then the metal would be brittle and easily broken. But if the blade was too thick, then it would become exhausting to swing. Because of these factors, greatswords wouldn't start to see common use until the latter half of the Six Astral Era. The Dark Knights of Curthus adopted two-handed greatswords since Trefaniel cast aside his shield long ago. This shieldless style that reflected self-sacrifice fit the doctrine of a Dark Knight perfectly, causing techniques involving these weapons to be honed over the centuries. Dark Knights are now masters at using a greatsword's reach and weight to their advantage. By becoming one with their weapon, they're allowing its momentum to carry them with shocking speed across the battlefield. Finally, we'll discuss their choice of armor. Ultimately, Dark Knight armor takes heavy inspiration from the Dragoons of Ishgard. This is the entire reason for the dragon-like spikes, horns, claws, and even scale-like patterns that often decorate a Dark Knight's armor. However, Dragoon armor is designed with mobility in mind, not defense, meaning that there isn't great coverage in delicate places. Using Dragoon armor as a base, Dark Knights reinforce the armor with extra chainmail and plating to provide the coverage and defense they would need without interrupting the flexibility provided around the joints. In this way, a Dragoon might dominate the sky, but a Dark Knight will ravage the earth. Eventually, Dark Knight armor would evolve over the years, but some of the themes from the original set would remain. As for the dark colors their armor usually takes, it's believed that this started as a method to declare that they were knights without a house or banner. And that will bring us to the end of our lesson. Theirs may be a dangerous and bloody road, but make no mistake, our world is that much safer thanks to the watchful eyes of Dark Knights and their shadowy vigil. To those who walk the path of the Dark Knight, hear me now. Yours will be a thankless task. At best, you will be appreciated. At worst, you will be vilified. But this will suit you just fine, because you understand. Monsters love to hide in and attack from the dark. But you will already be there, waiting for them. And you will be their executioner. Hello everyone! Thanks for staying to the end of the lesson. If you enjoyed this and want to see more, subscribe and like this video to let me know I'm doing well. If there is a topic you'd want me to cover in the future, leave a comment about it and I'll see what I can do. Until next we meet, I'll be researching even more of our world's rich lore to share with you. Till then, stay safe my friends!